Oh. Good to be with you all this morning. We'll just jump right back in to uh, Genesis and all the fun ahead. Let's see, get the right one. Press the right button. There, here we go. All right, Genesis. So two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 39, which is the story of Joseph and Potiphar. The wife tries to seduce Joseph, and then Joseph refuses and is thrown into jail, right? <laughs> but something about him has such a characteristic that he's in, put in charge of the jail, which leads us to where we are today for chapter 40. So we'll just jump straight in. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Now, Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in house in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he waited on them, and they continued for some time in custody. One night, they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled, so he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in custody in his master's house? Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So Joseph is in prison, but again, something is so evident and immediately observable about him that the captain of the guard gives him authority, which is fascinating by itself. And then Joseph has uh, has some, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not really clear. He serves these two folks, but then he also has some level of authority over them as well, right? Like he's taking them meals and waking them up or dealing with them in some way, but then also has some level of authority. It's not real clear. I don't know the politics of prison, I guess, well enough, or Egyptian prisons in the uh, 10th century BC to know exactly what it means. But there's clearly something a little different. He's he's able to come and go while they're still locked in their cells, I guess is the one thing we can say. So then Joseph, the dreamer, learns that these men have had troubling dreams. Big surprise, right? And in that context, he makes the bold prediction, do not interpretations belong to God, right? But that's a little different, isn't it? Um, this is comes from Brueggemann. Um, it's an extended quote, but hopefully will help. The dreams are not to be handled by human wisdom, by imperial administration, or by analytical decoding. They are rather the inbreaking of other purposes known only to God. Pharaoh, like every other imperial master, presumes a monopoly on knowledge. But in these dreams, knowledge is of another kind, and Pharaoh has no part in it. The monopoly of knowledge in the empire is broken. Pharaoh knows many things, but he does not know how to discern the movement of God's way within his realm. Only God knows that. And only Joseph does God's work in this situation. So Joseph is the utterly free and authoritative man who operates by God's gift and who is not answerable to the empire. He need heed neither Egyptian restraints nor Egyptian ways of knowing. Thus, Joseph's monopoly of dream interpretation of discerning the irresistible future is subversive to the empire. That's Brueggemann. So once again, we have that idea of a resistance narrative. Power is not in the hands of Pharaoh or of the captain of the guard or even uh, over these folks around him, but is instead in the hands of the prisoner, of Joseph, right? No one knows what's happening next except Joseph, who serves God. And here is the reversal. Here is true power. Here is life and hope. Um. We continue, God gives the gift of inter interpretation. This is from Pretham. Note the Tanakh translation, surely God can interpret without skipping a beat. Joseph urges them to tell him the dreams. In effect, he says, I have the gift of divine interpretation. Joseph thereby brings a public witness to God to bear on the situation. Interesting. So, pretty straightforward eight verses, but with that one line, Joseph's making some pretty big theological statements or a pretty big theological statement. Uh, what do you think? Is Joseph making a bold assertion here, or is he just giving a straightforward answer? Is it a resistance narrative, or just a public witness that God is on Joseph's 
side. Maybe it doesn't have to be an either or for any of them. I, I just, I, I wish we knew more about where this power, how this power got conferred to Joseph and what in him that they thought they, what led them to give him this power. Amen. Yeah, I don't know. Joseph is one of my two big theater credits in life, and the musical didn't sort that out either. <laughs> no. Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? Yeah. Uh, the one. Yeah. I do love that show, but it doesn't straighten a lot out. It's more fun. No, it than doesn't. A deep theological reflection. No. I have a gloss on the prison situation. Because <laughs> I can tell you about South Carolina prisons in the mid mm -hmm. 20th century, they had people called trustees that they trusted to be about in the community hmm. and to run errands and do things like that. And so oh, I'm assuming that's what Joseph was. Yeah, he seems to have a little bit more freedom for sure. Mm -hmm. But where does the power to interpret these dreams come from? That's not very clear, is it? Well, Joseph claims it comes from God, but then he's willing to claim that, that well, but God gave him the power. That he understands, though. You see, that that's the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not too straightforward. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll keep going because we have lots of dreams to share today. So only Joseph... <laughs> um, Oh, no, that's the back. That's the previous one. So the cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me. On the vine, there were three branches. And as soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But remember me when it is well with you. Please do me the kindness, the hesed, to make mention of me to Pharaoh. And so, get me out of this place. For in fact, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that should have put me into the dungeon. And the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable. He said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uttermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. Joseph answered, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a pole and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his cupbearing. He placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. The chief baker he hanged, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. All right, so I imagine most of us have heard these dreams. These are ones that get put out for all kinds of storytelling time, especially for kids and on. I've heard, I feel like I've heard them a million times and they're both perfectly told and perfectly interpreted by Joseph, right? Uh, the bigger question is sort of by uh, what, do, what do we do with this, right? Freetham and, and Brueggemann have some ideas, but this is not so easy. So Freetham makes one note. Joseph uses the interpretive moment to ask the cupbearer to show kindness, Hesed. Tends to act as God does in 39.21 and to intercede for Joseph's release before Pharaoh. Um, and just a note, hesed gets mentioned a lot, especially in the Psalms. Uh, it is the way God shows kindness, loving kindness is how it's often translated, uh, to people that God favors, right? God, show your hesed, show your loving kindness, your kindness, your love for me, to me. Uh, remember Israel and show your kindness to her. Um it's a very, very common Hebrew word, that, but it's almost exclusively used for how God 
cares for us, not how a random cupbearer would show kindness to Joseph. Although in this situation, we can certainly say that if the uh, cupbearer had remembered Joseph, he would have gotten out of prison, and that would have been some pretty good hesed in its own right, a salvific, saving, loving action, right? Uh, for the further notes, he, uh, that is Joseph, still needs human help. The one inspired by God pleads with a fellow prisoner for help. He has to be remembered by another, as God remembers Noah, Abraham, Rachel, and the people of Israel in Exodus, right? Human help will finally be a key of Joseph's future, as it will be for virtually everybody. Pritham also, I should have, I, don't, I did not quote him, but Pritham also had a great note about that Hesed remark, that uh, while he asks uh, the cupbearer for some, to be remembered and for some uh, loving kindness, he doesn't ask the baker for uh, to be remembered or for loving kindness because he knows that's not going anywhere. <laughs> um, but Freetham does ultimately note that the future is determined by God's dreams and decrees. And human action has an impact on this process as well, but it's not altogether clear how much human action can change or influence what God has determined, right? So that's the tricky part of these questions. Where is free will? Where is determinism slash fate slash God's decree? Because at least for these two stories, it seems like it's 100%. God's already made the choice. Cupbearer's going to live. Baker's going to die. And on we go to the next thing. I don't feel like there's as much human interaction there. Um, the only option would have been for the, for the cupbearer to actually remember Joseph, but Thoughts on that? Yeah, where is Joseph's reward? He gets nothing. Right. Yeah. But it does eventually. Yeah, we know the story. He does eventually, but I'm just wondering why not, not here. Yeah. I, my thought is that Joseph, if he were a kind of trusty, was out and about, and dreams or no dreams, he probably knew that the baker had different issues from the cup barrel, but that's just yes. me. Oh, I think you're right. Bill, you know I like to go into the weeds and pick at minutia, but I, I, I hear cup bearer and I hear three and I hear grapes, which yield wine. I, I don't know if I, I'm totally headed in the wrong direction with any of this but i just can't help I, I can't ignore those references you mean like just in terms of like a christological kind of yeah, overlay? exactly exactly and i know this is you know completely disconnected from that i mean i guess mm -hmm. but i just i i just i can't hear things like that without my mind going in a certain direction, I guess. So I don't know if there's anything there. I don't know if that's anything that theologians have argued about or not. Not that I know of, but it wouldn't surprise me if some Jewish theologians talk about the cupbearer and, uh, you know, because they have bread and wine as well, that there might mm -hmm. be connections. Certainly the fruit of the vine is a, a very common and powerful image in Isaiah and the Psalms in a variety of places, right? I mean, of having clear wines and good wines and, and those kinds of things. And and there is an imagery that is all that throughout scripture, Old and New Testament, of one day we dine with God and have these great wine that we can all enjoy together, right? Um, so I don't know that I would put it, I haven't, I'm sure there's some Christian theologian that found a way to twist it into a Last Supper reference or, or Jesus somehow. But I would imagine it, it probably is more in, all, along those lines of just the broad messianic feast, right? Of just here's. Okay. But, but uh, you know, even then that's a little bit of a thing. It may just be that the, the cupbearer got out. <laughs> the baker didn't. Hmm. And, and I mean, I looked at three different books and none of them mentioned anything like that, but so I'm going to say that there's probably not, but you never know. Okay. Just, you know. Yeah. You're, you're learning how my mind works. Uh, hey, amen. Bless your soul. 
All right, well, we'll look at the uh, the next. And so as you would, you would expect, Brueggemann has a little bit different perspective. He holds up the first dream as the more important one. For in that dream, Joseph has his promise and his destiny. But Brueggemann notes the text brings us to an incong incongruity where faithful people must live. How may we reconcile the grand claim of verse 8, which seems utterly effective, and the unrelieved pathos in verse 14 and 15, which ends in dismay, right? He claims that he's going to be freed. Oops, he doesn't get freed. And there, I mean, the other guy doesn't get freed and then there's dismay, right? So you have these sort of back and forth. And it's in that incongruity that human faithfulness must be practiced. You've got this promise that one day he will be the master of all, but he's not there yet, right? It's in that setting that the dream of God is tested. The dream of God for Joseph is not for times of obvious credibility. That is, it's well, when it gets fulfilled, but rather the dream of God is for times when the claims run against the evidence, which I thought was a fascinating way to talk about this. That is the dream, that prediction that Joseph is given that one day his brothers will bow down to him, meant to be a sustaining dream for Joseph because he is in prison and tested for some 14 years, right? He he leaves Israel between 14 and 16, and he's elevated at age 30. So he is, spends a solid 14 to 15, 14, 15 years, maybe even 16 years, depending on where you have him leaving, uh, in prison and in slavery. So hmm, is the dream perhaps meant for that, right? Um is the dream a promise and meant to sustain him, or did he need some time to grow into the role and boost some ego, uh, which could be part of it as well? That's not what Brueggemann's saying, but sometimes I wonder if he needed two more years to uh, mature a little bit, because sometimes when people are put in charge too early, too quick, well, it goes to their head. Those are all theoreticals, of course, but didn't know if we wanted to talk about them. Why can't it be both? Oh, it could certainly be both. Yeah. I just hadn't heard anybody other than Brueggemann. I mean, I've never heard that before, that the that the dream was meant to sustain, right? Or that's, and I mean, mm -hmm. we're honest, that's, that, that's true for all of us, right? We may not get a, a dream like Joseph had, but certainly that idea, that hope that God will be with us and is most powerful when we have hard times, it's super easy when we go, oh, God's with us. It was a great day for a baptism or an ordination or to get married or all these wonderful, wonderful moments, right? That's the easy time. But the dream of being God's people is the most important when, oh, when you're in divorce or you are sick, mm -hmm. people are having mm -hmm. a hard time, right? That's when the power of the dream is truly evident. to think on this is definitely one of those uh all of these stories all of the joseph stories when you start talking about dream and uh, knowing the future or having ideas of how the future will work it definitely brings up lots of questions of human action versus god's determined result and who gets to decide which right or do we get to decide anything we're just bouncing along behind god and and hopefully get something right that's there's so many questions that come up that make or you know if the brothers don't sell joseph into slavery then he can't go into egypt and if he's not then thrown back into jail he can't beat the cupbearer and the baker to then be connected to pharaoh like does this all have to happen to joseph does he have to go through all this hell so that he gets to the right person at the right time to do the right thing ah, i don't know But it's that sort of cyclical nature that I'll make it great can make it crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll jump into the to chapter 41 then. So after two whole years, 
Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And there came up out of the Nile seven sleek and fat cows, and they grazed in the reed grass. Wait, hold on. Yeah, the reed glass. Then seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and thin cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. The Pharaoh awoke. Then he fell asleep and dreamed of a second time. Seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. Then seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full years. Pharaoh awoke, and it was a dream. In the morning, his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Two years pass, and Pharaoh begins having these troubling dreams, right? So that's the basic turn. Um, Brueggemann then notes, the dream takes initiative away from Pharaoh. The king is no longer the subject, but the object. He receives messages. They, meaning kings, usually hear mostly good news, but the dream penetrates the royal isolation, right? Um, Freetham notes also are instead the same theme of this dream, the weak prevailing over the strong, characterized Joseph's own dreams. I'd heard that parallel. That was an interesting one, right? That uh, Joe, I think, well, Craig, you were asking, you know, when did Joseph get the power to understand these dreams? Well, Maybe it's because he's living it. <laughs> he, someone weak overcoming the strong. He's sort of like, oh, I know what that's about. I'm living that one. Sometimes we need that experience to have an idea of how things work. Um, but the stage is set either way for new things because of God's interventions. This is Brueggemann's note, right? Like if God doesn't force this dream into Pharaoh's brain, doesn't reveal these things to Pharaoh in his sleep, well, then nothing's going to change. Right, because the cupbearer has forgotten uh, Joseph. So, in a way, this is God remembering Joseph and trying to get him out of jail and into the place he needs to be by troubling the dreams of Pharaoh. Um, one other note as I read it that always makes me laugh um, dreams always have a certain, uh, they, they always have those sort of Com conflicted meanings, but they also don't always follow the rules of science or, or physics. I always found it sort of strangely, and I mean, I think I'd wake up too if I saw cows eating other cows, um, <laughs> or if I saw um, sheaves of wheat devouring or or dissolving other sheaves of wheat. I mean, like the, the images themselves, we sort of just take, because I guess we've heard of a million times, but if you were to have a dream like that, I think I'd wake up too pretty quick. Those are rather disturbing dreams when if you don't know what they mean or don't know what they are that's just weird right they're weird dreams so we're gonna have a lot of reading now because this is the process then of the whole story to pharaoh and the back and forth so then the chief cupbearer said to pharaoh i remember my faults in hebrew it's actually kata which is sins. I remember my sins today. He remembers that he was supposed to tell somebody about Joseph and screwed up, right? Um, and so he actually, it's a confession. Um, I'm not sure why they chose, uh, every translation I saw chooses to use uh, faults or my errors, which is, I guess, what sins are. But it's just interesting that the Hebrew word is literally sins, but people choose to use the, the lesser fault or mistake. But once Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain guard. We dreamed on this night, he and I, each having a dream with its own meaning. And a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, and giving an interpretation to each according to his dream. I'm going to pause there for just a second. He's not listed here as a, a prisoner, but as a servant of the captain which makes it interesting as well, right? What is he a prisoner or is he a servant? Is he a slave? Is he, what, uh, where is Joseph in this convoluted issue? 
He's lesser. He's caught, but it's still a weird spot. As he interpreted to us, so it turned out. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was hurriedly brought out of the dungeon. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pilate. So, no one commented on that line, that second half of 14, but I find it to be fascinating. Um, and fascinating because why would you mention that he had to shave and change his clothes and get cleaned up to go see Pharaoh unless there's a meaning behind it? Uh, Freetham says, uh, did did make a quick note of it and just said, oh, he it's the symbol that his situation is changing. Uh, maybe. I think it's more showing that even as the leader of this prison, he still wasn't really particularly well cared for, right? Uh, I think more of, uh, I guess, the bedraggled look of Jean Valjean at the beginning of Les Mis and needing a haircut and a shave and a bath because he isn't allowed it than anything else. And that going before Pharaoh, he needed to look presentable. But it is an interesting, quick, one-off sentence. He was hurriedly brought, but then eh, it takes a little while. You got to clean you up before you get in there. So it was an emergency, but not so much he couldn't be, he, you know, was going to come in smelly. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile and seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Then seven other cows came up after them, poor, very ugly and thin. Never had I seen such ugly ones in all the land of Egypt. The thin and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had done so, for they were still as ugly as before. Then I awoke. I fell asleep a second time, and I saw in my dream seven ears of grain, full and good, growing on one stalk. And seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouting after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. When I told it to the magicians, there was none who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. and The seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. Seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, as they, are, as are the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind. And they, they are seven years of famine. It is, as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. After them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. Plenty will no longer be known in the land because of the famine that will follow, for it will be very grievous. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a man who is discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and lay up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to befall the land of Egypt. So the land may not perish through the famine. All right, so Brueggemann points, as you would expect, to the powerlessness of Pharaoh, the powerlessness of empire. Versus the authority and power of both God and Joseph, right? Uh, both in the interpretation and the prescription of what to do. Pharaoh literally has no idea what's going on. The wise people, the wise men and magicians don't have a clue what's going on. It's only Joseph, this Hebrew from uh, the Middle East, from Israel, from broadly that area, that knows what's supposed to happen. The reversal is the heart of God's plan, right? That's what we have known for the story the whole time. And at the same time, this is a Brueggemann quote, the fixed purpose of God is no occasion for human abdication. 
The firm purpose of God requires bold royal action. God's purpose is not the end of human planning, but the ground for it. Which is an interesting approach to this idea. Then Fratham says, Joseph emphasizes throughout that God has revealed the meaning of the dream to Pharaoh. Joseph thereby identifies a direct relationship with God. Both to him and to Pharaoh, right? But I think this proves Joseph's political brilliance as he boldly stares down the power of empire and position. He actually gives Pharaoh some power back. Like he could have just come and said, you're an idiot. These guys are idiots. Uh, God's going to cause a famine and then he's going to, you know, he's going to give seven years of surplus and seven years of famine. And if you had a clue what you're doing, uh, then, then you would know that. But instead he chooses to say, oh, well, God has given this to Pharaoh. God has given this wisdom to Pharaoh. God has given this revelation to Pharaoh. God has given this dream to Pharaoh, right? It's proof, again, if this is a resistance narrative, which I believe it is, then this is the classic way someone without power allies themselves with someone with power. Joseph knows that Pharaoh doesn't have a clue what's going on. He knows the Egypt doesn't know what's going on. He knows they're not going to make it without him. But he chooses, instead of being oppositional, chooses to find ways to co-opt that power and take it for himself, right? The interesting thing is, when I was reading both Freetham and uh, Brueggemann and looking at the uh, Jewish uh, the J Jewish Publication Society translation, all of them sort of did the same thing, which was, oh, Joseph puts himself in the right position, or he doesn't explicitly say that he should be uh, in charge, which is true. He doesn't explicitly say that. But everything that he does positions himself to be placed in charge. And it's the only way he can position himself to be in charge is by saying, oh, Pharaoh's a smart guy. Pharaoh knows how to do this. Here's an idea for how Pharaoh could do this. He just needs to find someone really good who knows how to do things like I just said. Um, I mean, he puts himself, I, I guess the thing that I found funny was all of those scholars were hesitant to act like Joseph was trying to get the job. I don't know why, but I feel like that was 100% Joseph's plan in the situation. As he heard the story, he's like, oh, I can finally get out of jail. <laughs> I can finally get free here. God's given me an opportunity. I'm going to take it. Um, and I don't see why there's a problem with that. Uh, there, there's almost this weird thing, like, I guess he shouldn't want power, or, but he clearly does. He clearly wants to get out of there. Um, uh, other thoughts on those ideas there. I mean, that's a pretty big chunk of dream and space. We have a, we started with a dream. We had some dreams, and now these dreams bring finally Joseph into the power that the original dreams called for. I can't help thinking that the Silicon Valley Bank shouldn't have had Joseph for its risk asset management. <laughs> yeah that probably could have helped them <laughs> any questions about the dreams presented Joseph's actions anything at all I guess we've all heard him so many times it's hard to get too far behind them, isn't it? And they're pretty. I, I would, if I had been Pharaoh, I would not have had a clue what those dreams meant. But it's sure nice to have someone like Joseph explain something that otherwise doesn't make sense. Y'all are quiet today. That's all right. So, uh, I actually was going to stop here mainly because I thought we wouldn't get this far. <laughs> but it's okay. Um, I mean, the big thing I would say is, I mean, and really we could look at the rest of the chapter. The rest of the chapter is simply Pharaoh goes, why don't we put you in charge? Joseph is in charge. He gets a wife. He gets land, money. He gets everything, right? He gets put as the number two. And truly the breathtaking part of that reversal is that, uh, he is literally put in charge of the biggest empire in the in the world at that point, right? Like it's 100% Pharaoh, and then number two is Joseph, and he is completely in charge, given an Egyptian name, 
um, and an Egyptian wife and has two kids. And as the chapter closes out, he is doing all the stuff he said that should be done while the rest of the world is locked in famine and disaster. Which is part of why I think I like and appreciate this story. It's quick. There's not a lot of extra fluff around the edges. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Any other thoughts today, my friends? On this or any of it? On the whole arc? Because this is really 37 to to now. I'm good. No. Well, man, y'all are moving. We're moving today. Oh, oh, I mean, it's that. just this piece about faithfulness. I mean, it's like hang in there with God, and, um, and you know, and we and we get you know we get this message, you know, that it's not it's not it is not I, it is God working within me. That's that's who's doing this. I mean, that's our that's our message. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely, it's God. But why is God doing this for the Pharaoh? Ah, uh, good question. Well, it certainly seems to be at least in part that I would argue God doesn't want anyone to die. Like he was, he wants to preserve Egypt, his children in Egypt, as much as he wants to preserve the the sons of uh, of Jacob. But then there's the story of Moses, Bill. Come on now. Yeah. All right. God did not try to save the Egyptians then, did he? No. Or she. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Well, d does God bring on the family? Yeah. <laughs> or does he just alert them that it's coming? <laughs> right. Uh, this was the question we did Job last night with uh, the rabbi and I, and that was that's the eternal Just question, thinking. right? Who who brings Just the bad all. stuff and who's in control? We didn't come up with an answer last night either. <laughs> I'm pretty much sure it's not me. I, I'm I'm pretty positive it's not me. Yes, we did decide that. Uh, um, you know, all those kinds of bad theology kind of responses that says it's because of something you did that you get punished or get sick or have these problems is not the answer. But we didn't come up with, well, is it God? Is it Satan? Is it some bargain between the two? I mean, all those kinds of things that not that's none of that is clear. Uh, I mean, you could you could get into some some sort of predestination notions if you wanted to here. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I imagine. <laughs> I'm oh, sure we could read Calvin nice. and find all of this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. John would, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Calvin would be happy to tell you all about how predestined Joseph was and the brothers and everybody in between because of God's promise for them, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are, yeah, this is a, it's a fascinating, there, the story itself, I don't feel like has many questions, but there's lots of questions around the edges of the story all the way around, right? Like on, on one level, the prayer, the, the dream is the dream, the interpretation is the interpretation, the result is the result. There's not a lot of wiggle room within that, but there's lots of questions around it. <laughs> Who causes the famine? Why is there a famine? Who, did people have to die so that Joseph could be put in charge and they all would get down to Egypt? I mean, it, uh, countless questions about how this all works or is it predestination is you know the god predetermined all these things uh, from before time or is this just god's reacting to the fact that joseph got sold into slavery and so he figured out a way to get him out of jail I, whew, we don't get an answer but there are lots of questions i mean pharaoh pharaoh honors joseph but, but does pharaoh honor god you right see? yeah <laughs> well and it's <laughs> pharaoh honors uh honors joseph only in as much as he serves him and does what he needs 
Exactly. Right. That was sort of part of our conversation last night and part of the conversation of uh, uh, the book of Job, right? The whole argument that Satan brings forward is, well, the only reason, the only reason this guy Job likes you is because you give him good stuff. If you take away his stuff, he won't like you anymore. Um, right. And it's that sort of that idea. Um, and uh, what T.S. Eliot's, it's my, it's one of my favorite quotes from T.S. Eliot uh, in uh, Murder in the Cathedral, where Beckett's trying to decide if he should be martyred or not. And the last uh, he's being tempted the last time, like, oh, if you are, if you do die, then you will become famous and you will become revered as a martyr and prophet. And um, Beckett famously says uh, the last the last is the greatest. The last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Right. Are we doing it for the right reason because it serves God or just because it gives us something that we want? Um, Pharaoh, I think 100 percent in this case, only supports Joseph because he gave him a good answer to the dream story and can serve him. And the only question answer, there and the only answer to the dream story. Nobody else had one. Right. Right. It's the only answer and it's the best answer. And it's well, let's give it a shot because what else could it do? <laughs> Not going to hurt anybody. OK. And. And, and it's kind of funny that you brought up Job. Job is probably one of the more interesting books in the entire Bible. The problem is, I just don't like the way it ends. And Job lived happily ever after. But that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm not a big... Well, I'm not a big fan of the idea that like, oh, well, he gets another wife and some more kids. So therefore, everything's okay. And you're like, I don't think that's... I don't think and if I lost my entire really, family, right, I exactly. go, well, I got another one. It's all, we're all good here. Yeah, like, and I live happily ever after. Stefan, we talked like last good. night. We talked last night about whether that's the real ending or if it really ended in a dung heap and somebody added something later on. Yeah. 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 Highly possible. Okay, but then. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, my friends. Well, hey. Great to see you all. Hope to see you this weekend and we'll uh we'll see you next week for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Take care, y'all. Have a good one, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Early. My goodness. Early, yeah. <laughs> yeah.